I am Vero and you're watching Modern Immigrant. Welcome everybody to a new episode of Modern Immigrant. As every Monday, we're here bringing a new episode and a new story that I know is going to touch your heart and it's going to inspire you because that's what it did to me. Before I introduce to you the guests of this week, I want to remind you that you can always check out our Instagram at Modern Immigrant if you want to keep all updated on all the things that we're doing in this space and also get to know a lot of other stuff that's happening outside of the podcast so go check out at modern immigrant and also check out our website modernimmigrant.net so you get to learn a little bit more about each guest and you also get to learn and connect with them remember that all of the links to connect with the guests um, are down below in the description. I always love to hear when you reach out to the guests and you connect with them and you connect with their stories. And today our guest is Andreina and Andreina is originally from Venezuela, but this interview we decided to do it in English because Andreina wants to be able to share her experiences and her story with all her friends and all the community she had built in Denmark. So we're gonna be talking about how was that immigration from Venezuela to Denmark, all the opportunities, all the opportunities she has been able to accomplish, how is living over there, what have been some of the challenges and the learnings, and you have to stay all the way to the end of the interview because she's going to share something so cool and so interesting about her experience in Denmark in an interview. She was featured in an amazing newspaper, and there's a little bit of a background story that you do not want to miss. So I'm really happy that you're here today. Please don't forget to subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube or subscribe in any of the platforms that you might be listening to this interview. I'm really happy that you are here. So get comfortable and enjoy this episode. I was actually gonna ask you, Andreina, how do people call you in English? Like... Andre, Andreina, <laughs> I was gonna give you the welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, Andreina, 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 or for example, here in Denmark, it's they cannot roll the tongue, so then they will say something like Andreina or Andrina, or there are so many variations to my name by now that uh, <laughs> I know it's me they are talking about, like now, yeah. That's what matters. So, Andreina, I would say it in Spanish, uh, welcome to Modern Immigrant. I'm really, really happy that you're here with us and that you're going to share your story in the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting <laughs> me and having me here. Yeah, it's exciting. And I always start each interview, Andreina, um, asking my guests when did their immigration story start or how, so we can have a little bit of context. Where were you? What was the initial idea? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, it starts, um, I would say it's like a two-folded uh, uh, thing here because I came to Denmark the first time in the, the summer of 2010 and I came as an exchange student and my, my, my plan was just to come here, you know, have the high school experience because I was already done with high school in Venezuela by then in that year. And then I came here and then for me it was to live something like in the movies, right? That this thing that we have the experience of like going to the parties and then taking the bus home because in Venezuela, we, we know that uh, we have certain limitations when it comes to let's be too crazy outside or until too late and so forth. So for me, it was uh, super cool to, to just come to Denmark and ex have actually that experience. And, and the way I say, uh, I understood it afterwards. It was, you know, back then in a, still, yeah, 2008, 2009. And so we were having um, a lot of protests in Venezuela, which I was very active as well. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking we are fighting for freedom here. And then we have this freedom fight, but I didn't really know what freedom was until I came here. Wow, that's so and, powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and it was so fantastic and yeah, powerful as you're saying because then I'm like, aha, uh -huh, so this is actually what we want. It makes sense. Mm. And that, uh, that is a moment of realization for me. I was 18 years old uh, at the time and uh, I think it's a pretty, 
harsh or a good um, way to connect with the reality. And uh, um, yeah, so back then it was fantastic. The best year of my life, maybe as wow. a PhD student, but for me, uh, I was never gonna stay here because this was a temporary. I see. Uh, and before you continue to, to share that part, I would love to ask, how, if you can describe how that freedom felt, like what were those, some of those things, were you able to find some sort of like, okay, yeah, this is kind of what I thought it was going to be. Um, what was the part that you enjoyed the most from that year and how different it was from maybe in Venezuela? Yeah. Um, well, there, I think uh, like some good examples that uh, I was living in a tiny, tiny, town in the countryside uh, here in Denmark and coming from Caracas, right. well, <laughs> one of the big differences that uh, like uh, waking up and then just walking to the bus and then the bus will leave us right in front of school. That's something that I have never experienced before because the dynamics in my house back then, I have two sisters and then we were always like putting the uniform on and then my mom had to drove, drive us to school and yeah. you know, there are so many different things. You are depending on a lot of people and he was just like, first you don't have wear a uniform, then just go to the bus. <gasps> the school system here is so different than in Venezuela. In Venezuela, we are sort of like caged in the yeah. school and I guess that that's that is because uh, of security reasons, but also they, I guess that they try to avoid that people leave uh, in, during the school hours. Here you can go in and out as you please. Basically, they wow. don't. Yeah, they're not I checked felt... in on you. And it, it, it was probably yeah. really crazy for you those first days. Like, wait, can I just walk out and go to my house? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, and like, oh, I actually, you know, when you're a teenager, like, oh, I don't want to have a lunch here at school. I would like to walk to the bakery, and then you just go with your friends and have lunch somewhere else, and then come back. And uh, that that is <laughs> very different, very wow. different. And it is it, it, at the beginning, I guess, that is a pill hard to swallow in a way because you don't know what to do with that much freedom, even though that I was 18. Um, back then and you would think like oh but 18 you are an adult already but not really in Venezuela mm -hmm. you are so protected by your parents that uh, like you, you uh, we would still is, live yeah. at home for example like that's something that here you're 18 like in the US and then you're like live by yourself we don't do that so it's very no no yeah. no, no you live in your house when you get married when you're married not even so, exactly yeah so yeah. so it was like uh, maybe a shock Mm. Uh, maybe it's a cultural shock uh, that yeah. uh, just knowing like, okay, can I actually do this? And then I was checking with my host mom, like, oh, can I do this? And she was like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Just send me a text message. And as long as I know where you are, that's fine for me. <gasps> In Caracas, like if I had to tell my mom mm. just with a text message, like I'm here, that would never happen because then she would be like, and who's going to drive you? And who's going right. to pick you up? And then who's going to do this? And who are the parents of that person? Give me the phone number. Uh, yeah. you know, it's just like so, so different. Wow. And, um, but just to go back to your initial question, I left in 2011. I went went back to Venezuela because I was uh, set to start at the Universidad Simón Bolívar. Okay. Um, what, uh, and then I started there uh, and <gasps> had the three, almost three fantastic years uh, with, with a lot of friends, a lot of studying. I think I've never studied that much in my life. That's uh, a very strict yeah. university, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> it was so tough, uh, so tough, but uh, my life was in the university. Now, like looking back in retrospective, I was just there from eight to eight. And it was my home. Wow. Yeah, and but then in uh, yeah 2014, mm -hmm. uh, then my mom. No, at the end of 2013, I was driving back from from La Simon from the university, and my mom called me in the car, and then she said, like I guess that it was in an outburst of emotions or something. She said, I think you have to leave. Uh, because you are completely wasting your potential here. The university was going through some uh, like uh, strikes and so forth. So uh, nothing was clear. And she just called me. I remember I was driving uh, and uh, she said, 
you have to leave and this is the best that could happen and you have my full support and uh, just uh, like you have to study something where you are going to be able to finish because in La Simone then it, it, it was very unclear what it was going to happen right and uh, and she said please do the due diligence and uh, figure out where is it that you are going to go and you know I, I, I was thinking well what a better place to go than the place that it was already a home to me and that felt like home so for me it was pretty natural to to decide to mm. come back to, to Denmark and so I did I applied um, to a study here at uh, in Aarhus University and uh, to only that one because that's the only thing that I wanted to do it was also pretty clear to me what I wanted Amazing. and if it's not that it's not anything then I'm not leaving because but Andrina, how can we get your clarity on things? Because that's, I feel like as immigrants and, and the interviews I have had, like the struggle is the not knowing, right? Like not knowing what we want, not knowing how do we want it. It's kind of like the unknown uh, when we leave our homes that it gives us like some sort of a structure. Like growing up in Caracas, I feel like we go to school, we know we're probably going to go to one of the four big universities. Like we kind of have things yeah planned out and then when you arrive to a new country or a new city you're like oh wow now I have so many opportunities right um were you able yeah. to finish that career in La Simone or you moved no. to Denmark okay to continue like were you planning on doing the same degree how was that yeah no uh, I was uh, studying a uh, math in uh, in Venezuela and that's one of also the things that gave me so much clarity because I knew that that is what I didn't want to do. Oh, I see. Okay, that's so good. I, no, no, I, knowing what you don't want. That's a good way to start. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And then I just, uh, I found this degree which was like made for me basically. Uh, uh, that The one I took in my bachelor's and uh, I said, well, it's that or nothing and uh, that's the way it is. What was it? What was the degree? It's a Bachelor of, uh, of Engineering in Global Management and Manufacturing. And for me, it was also important saying like, okay, if I'm going to Denmark, I'm going to take this degree in a university that is in the top 100 of the uh, best universities. I saw they, I had also some sort of criteria. I was not like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, obviously for me, it was important that if I was uh, going to come over here and then my parents were going to pay for it, that it was uh, definitely something that I could uh, use forward uh, exactly. in life. And uh, like a good presentation card, if that makes sense. And how, no, that's amazing. Yeah, like making sure that you, you knew what you wanted, where to get it, and that was going to, somehow looking at the future, you knew that was going to give you some opportunities moving on. Um, how is moving from Venezuela to Denmark in terms of, okay, you enter a university, what language do you need to speak? How was the process um, of applying? Like, was it really hard in terms of um, your the requirements they ask for an international student, if that makes any sense, <laughs> what I'm asking? Um, yo, I, I can definitely put some words to that. And uh, I had to obviously uh, demonstrate that I could speak English because this was an English, uh, English course, okay. uh, study. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then having uh, good grades, obviously that always helps. And uh, uh, I've been lucky enough to be very strict uh, with myself uh, and uh, yeah, be a bit of a freak maybe <laughs> sometimes. Uh, wanting to just do the best and if it's not the, the best then I'm not satisfied that also definitely puts a burden uh, mm. extra burden on me but uh, it was basically that uh, show that I had good grades mm. that uh, okay. I could speak English and uh, that um, yeah then fulfilling some of the other requirements that uh, they had and I remember that uh, back then you still needed to send some hard copies uh, to yeah. the university with all this stuff. Now everything is uh, online. Online, so yeah. Easy, and then you just pay the fee and then they make an assessment or tell you yes or no. And um, Wow. So it, it was pretty straightforward and I just did it for that single degree. And if it's not that, it's nothing. Uh, and you got it. Yeah. So it was perfect. <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I actually think that the, that the real hardship of uh, the immigration in my story it goes it comes afterwards mm -hmm. because I came here uh, to Denmark and I'm so uh, incredibly lucky and uh, blessed to have uh, parents that uh, said just do it and we will figure it out uh, right. But back then you still sort of relied on Kadivi, right? And then I remember that I did all my applications, like the hooks for the thing and the staples were in the right order. Yeah. And the, my folder was perfect. It was impeccable. And I, I was, I think at some point already known by the people in the office in Kadivi because I went almost every day to check on my application. Why have I not received anything? And then I remember that at some point before I had to travel, they say it is pre-approved. They tell me like it is pre-approved. So go and you will receive the like confirmation when you are there and no worries. They, oh. Your parents pay for the first semester and the, then they we make some sort of refund or something like that. So just one then, second, just to do like a parenthesis here. So they tell, so Kadivi, we talk about Kadivi in some previous episodes and we also did it obviously with a Venezuelan guest and we did it in English, which was really hard to explain Kadivi in English at that time. Uh, but yeah, so pretty much the government needs to approve the money in the coin or the, the dollars, I guess. That's... There's no way for, uh, back then, there was no way for a Venezuelan to pay for a degree or a travel or a trip expenses with their own money. They needed to get this, like, pre-approval or whatever. It's a little complex, but you're pretty much, like, I don't know how to say this, but you're not free in spending your money, pretty much. Um, exactly. So that's just for people that maybe might not know what Kadivi is. So they told you to go, even though it was pre-approved. They were like, you yeah, can go. They said, they said, yeah, because I, I think I went uh, maybe three days before uh, actual traveling. And then they said, it is pre-approved. You are going to receive the email when you're over there. So no worries. And maybe they only told me this to because they didn't want to have me <laughs> there anymore. Keep checking. Know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, keep checking. But I, I left. And I came here, uh, it was August 2014, and uh, then uh, in, in uh, like almost in October, they had not sent me anything yet. And I was, I remember like sending emails like, hey guys, what's going on and, and so forth. And I'm one day sitting in, the, in the, my classroom here, and I see that I get an email from, from Kadivi. And I'm like, yes, finally, because there are so many constraints and then basically then they are saying uh, well we are sorry to tell you that your application has been rejected because uh, your uh, engineering study so what will translate to a production engineer it is not a part of uh, like a priority for the development of our nation <laughs> and then you are like Fuck. wow i don't know if i'm allowed to say so no yeah you are <laughs> here, but, uh, <laughs> you are but, Basically, I said fuck, and I remember I went out of the classroom because I didn't know if I wanted to cry, like, mm. or what to do. And I remember sitting there at the stairs of the university, and I said to myself, "I have two options." And this is the kind of um, um, moments that are so decisive in life, and uh, to such a young age, I think. Um, I said I have two options for the like my first option it's to cry and well accept that this is gonna be impossible because my parents were not gonna be able to pay for every semester plus send me money like it is an insane amount of money uh, that we didn't have and uh, then I said I maybe I think I should go back to Venezuela I still had a like a return uh, ticket. ticket. And then I said, do that. And well, with my tail between my legs, basically, and uh, just accept that it didn't happen, even though I'm here, or I can stay and move heaven and uh, earth to make it happen. And I, I think it's obvious what I decided to do. And, uh, 
<laughs> that is so pretty. I got chills in my skin. Wow. No, it was it was so hard. I never I had never worked a day in my life, and the, all of a sudden I was uh, having like a cleaning uh, jobs uh, in houses and in uh, like a. For, well, there was one uh, a bit special for me because it was in the Danish school here when you come as a foreigner then there are these uh, language schools where everyone is sent to to learn the language so then I was cleaning uh, the school in the mornings like from five in the morning to eight and then from eight twenty to four going to the normal lectures at the university and then from five thirty to eight going to the language school so I was actually in this cycle, starting my day and finishing my day, both in the place where I work and in the <laughs> place that I'm also learning something. Wow. And I remember that before my, for example, my um, the school part of the language school was over, then I was already checking how dirty the classrooms were because then I knew that the next day it was going to be really hard. Um, <laughs> you were like taking notes and also checking the corners. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, and like hating on people when oh. you see that they are drawing in the on the tables, you know, like they are draw, uh, drawing something, and then I'm like, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that, you know. I'm <laughs> gonna have to go to to scrub it uh, the next day. Wow, um, Andreina, the perspective. Like, I one of yeah. the questions I want to ask you is, what were those things that you learned? Because it's so amazing to hear that you, you know, we have the power to decide what we want. But that doesn't make it easy. It doesn't mean that, oh, yeah, I, I, I want to stay. I want to finish this. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. What have been some learnings throughout this amazing journey? What have you learned from yourself? Oh, what haven't I learned? <laughs> uh, but I, I think, uh, like, looking back, I trust your God. That's, I, I have made some pretty crazy decisions and now I'm at 28 right and then I look back at those uh, seven years ago and then I think what <laughs> I was crazy I probably would never <laughs> do that again and like, taking so much risk mm -hmm. and but if 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 you like you can feel that it's the right thing for you then I would just say go for it and that's the same advice I would give to my young self uh, as well it is gonna be really tough and you will want to quit uh, many times and I think also looking at how other people had it like mm. uh, it's not like I was having a bad life but it was definitely not my plan uh, mm -hmm. the, of what was happening and then you see like other friends that I had that maybe were having the best life in the US or this and that and they didn't, never had to work but mm. there was also that point where I got my first paycheck like from first money I've ever made in my life I didn't know what to do right and it was not big it was not big <laughs> right. but it was but That's I was too. like if this is hard earned money that I woke up at 4 30 in the morning to go for this shift and clean and then I had other jobs like a uh, building stages for concerts and uh, oh, wow. like different things that has sort of shaped me and uh, at this point, I can tell you, maybe before I was afraid of work, but right now, like, bring it on. I don't care what it is. I I know that I, I can pull through and I can do it. But this mm. period didn't last that long. I was, uh, at the same time, uh, I was figuring it out, like, figuring out how am I going to pay for the next semester? Because the first one, my parents had paid for. True. And then it, how does this happen because then I have still uh, three more years I need to pay school for and uh, I have to pay rent like what I was making was already there just to pay my rent and uh, food a little bit and so um and I then again I think there is a thing of luck or yeah having good people around you like a good set of people that is you know that it's gonna mm -hmm be with you and support you uh, no matter what and I have had the opportunity here of meeting fantastic mm -hmm. uh, fantastic people that have helped me through the journey and uh, and eventually uh, got so much help and then the university uh, we sent an application to the university saying like look I 
speak Danish, I love Denmark, I have good grades, I'm actually a good student, I'm committed to, to make a life here, just please consider because the, the university doesn't give away um, scholarships to bachelor uh, degree students, it's only for master's degree and I that's see. the policy that they have. So we knew that it was a shot in the dark but it's something that we had to try and we sent it and uh, like, well, let's see what happened. I was in the newspaper. There's a like a huge article, like when people like uh, like this photographer came to school to take these uh, pictures of me for the newspaper. I was oh, feeling yeah. like this is not the way I wanted to <laughs> to be a celebrity. This is not like, <laughs> and this is, this was a small town. I don't want to be the girl from the newspaper. And then even I met people like, oh, how is it going? You are the girl from the newspaper, like really moving. I read the article and I was like... Wow, and yeah, that newspaper, that article was sharing the story of you coming from Venezuela, trying here, to stay, okay. Yeah, <gasps> no, being able to, okay, and what happened? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I it was, a, it was, a, yeah, it was the 9th of December, 2014, and uh, I was sitting with uh, my group do, doing some statistics assignment, uh, and then one of the like uh, I don't uh, well, I don't know this word in in English, but like the person's like a counselor, okay, like a student counselor, yeah, at the university. She I see that she comes out from her office and then she's coming towards me, and uh, she says, "Have you have you checked your email?" She asked me because I was uh, at that point popular for the bad situation <laughs> I was with some people in the university knew what was going on and uh, and then I'm like no and she's like check your email and then I go in my email and you know in the in the gmail you can see like preview of the first line yeah and the email started uh, with something like dear Andreina we have uh, reviewed uh, your application for a scholarship and unfortunately dot 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 and I'm like no, this I hate the unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, like this woman must be so evil that she comes here and I'm with my friends to make me cry. Like this happening very fast in my head. I open the email and like, and unfortunately, or like normally we wouldn't, uh, we don't offer scholarships to bachelor degree students, but we have assessed your situation and with everything and we have decided to give you a full scholarship for the rest of your studies with some uh, uh, like a, a monthly uh, payment also to be in the same uh, level as my Danish co-students because here they get a, a, a scholarship from the government every month and I was you know it's just those moments I remember that I couldn't believe I what you read it again and again. <laughs> I was not sure. Was you like in those I moments you want to ask someone else like, can you read it and tell me what you think this means? Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. Basically, like, guys, please just read this and tell me that I'm not dreaming. I started shaking, like, I started sweating, and uh, you know, there are so many emotions, and I thought it is worth uh, just to try and to like trust your God, like I say, and voice your needs and try to find this uh, support system in people that will also hold your hand and say like, okay, I can help you with this, I can help you with that. I think sometimes when we are uh, immigrants or like other people that I have had the, the chance to meet, we are afraid of voicing the hardships sometimes mm. because we are ashamed of like all being like a problem or like a, being the one that is in a drama or the victim mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly but i was like fuck it if i have to like survive survive here i also need to let the world know in which situation i'm in because maybe someone will help and that was that was happened and uh, that's what what happened and Eventually, and they made that exception, yeah. like they made the exception yeah. of something that a lot of people wouldn't even try because they would say, no, they don't do that for bachelors, right? Like they, yeah. it's exactly. a rule and the fact that like what you're saying and your story has so much meaning and power because you push those things just to give it a try, right? In those cases, it's like, well, they could have said no and you would have found another yeah. way to pay. But they said, yes, they assess your situation and I don't know, like, when you're sharing this and when you were talking about 
we have this difficulty to share hardships, I feel like because we come from a privileged position, like I can identify the fact that you come from a country that I come from to a city, we had opportunities back then. It's kind of hard for us to say we need help when we're abroad because we know we had a lot of support. We know we come from a family that could help us, but we can right now. It's like we're not used to being in the position of asking for help and we kind of feel bad about it. Like, I don't want to be taking yeah. away opportunities from other per, you know, um, but things change and sometimes we do need that help. And like you're saying, just being proud of the fact that you did it rather than, yeah. Oh no. Absolutely. Totally. Absolutely. Wow. So, yeah. so amazing. Yeah. And after that, after that, then it, I, I think it has been a roller coaster that has only gone up. And uh, then I got to work at one of the like uh, most famous and best uh, companies uh, here in Denmark and in the world in the Lego group for five years. And it was a fantastic experience. I graduated as one of the first of my class, got a second scholarship for doing the master's, like first <laughs> student ever, <laughs> like I'm, uh, like I would say, like they would say here in Denmark, I'm a, I'm a lucky potato. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lucky potato. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so, but I wow. think it's, it's uh, being constant mm. and uh, being constant and getting involved and uh, helping out and uh, showing actually how you can contribute and how you bring value. And this mm. is the country of opportunities, in my opinion. This here. People have an abil ability of supporting and really setting up, creating a platform for you if they see that mm -hmm. you want to, to succeed, basically. And um, that for me has been mm -hmm. instrumental. I think it has been key uh, because probably if I was in another country where the culture was a bit different, yeah. um, then that wouldn't have been the case. It really sounds like, at least in your experience, Denmark has been an, a country that really opened opportunities for you as an immigrant. It seems like it's a country that people can find those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, not everything is, is perfect. There are some other downsides, like they say, like expats have a hard time coming here, like making friends or being friends with the Danish people and, and so forth. But... Uh, in my case, all my friends are Danish, most of my friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I think, yeah, it's also wow. like try to, not trying to fit in. It's not like you have to change, but it's also you need to, when in Rome, do as Romans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And be part of it and be a part of the society and see, for example, here, it's about contributing and building mm. uh, our country and the, uh, I, I want to be part of that because mm. this country has given me way more opportunities than my own. And maybe some people that are listening to this may feel like, oh, fuck, she's a traitor. But I, I do feel I do feel uh, Danish in so many aspects of my life. Mm. And uh, I have so much to thank that, uh, that I can only uh, feel that I just need to give back. That is, yeah. No, I, I completely understand that feeling. And that's a beautiful feeling. It's beautiful to find a second home. It's beautiful to connect with another culture. I feel like it adds on, right? We don't need to leave behind things that we still are or places that still mean a lot to us. We can just kind of gain um, that. And I think it's beautiful. And I want to ask you one last thing. Um, I, I remember that the person that connected us for this interview mentioned something beautiful about that article that you were saying um, in the newspaper and that it was like a famous picture or a wall that was behind you or something like that. Yeah. Um, were you interview back again or tell us a little bit on, on how that story kind of ended? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, this picture, uh, the one that was taken back in 2014, Yes, uh, we use as a background one uh, like famous uh, wall in the university that it's like this orange, uh, red uh, kind of uh, wall. And 
you can see me there and uh, if you could see the picture like I should have actually had oh well, how to show you if you send it to me I can put it right here in the video when yeah, we're talking okay. so people can watch okay, cool. yeah yeah okay let's take a little break so you get to see the two pictures and I'll continue to listen to the wonderful story I can I can definitely do that and you can see my expression it's sadness basically because I'm in a moment of, of, of uh, a lot of uh, problems or trying to figure out worries and so forth and then last year at the end of last year, I was uh, contacted by by a big a European project that they, they are doing here. That it's a, a technology Denmark, and they call me to be one of like the talents that they want to display for a, like a success story of uh, of foreigners uh, actually having a good life here and uh, uh, working within tech and and so on. And then they go back to the university and then they take a picture in the same background. And they didn't know about and this. Like it wasn't that you asked. I had, I had not, no, 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 no. I had <laughs> not thought about it. And then, but when I, I went back home, I received the pictures and then they say like, oh yeah, select the ones that you like. And I was just thinking, yeah, six years ago uh, or so, I took a picture in the same spot and hell things have changed that is so that's pretty like when i look at both pictures then it's just like here i'm starting a journey that mm. I, I i don't know what has in it and actually i get a bit uh, i am touched. getting a little touched too yeah by thinking about this um, <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, so many things have changed and the uh, I have learned so much and I have met so many fantastic people and uh, have learned and uh, now I have the, like the job I always wanted to have and I have had so many opportunities and so many people that have believed in me and at some points I was like, why do they even believe in me? Because I didn't even win myself. Right, right. We're so hard on ourselves, and you had it. Like they were seeing that potential in you. They were seeing that. I mean, you you were working extra jobs, going to school. Like there's so many people that wouldn't even do ten percent of what you were doing. Right, that passion, that drive. Like you are all the inspiration, yeah. seriously. And and what a full circle, right? That then you went back yeah. to be a role model. Because you are a role model for other people, too. Yeah, and amazing. It's crazy when they ask me to like speak at this, uh, like uh, some uh, events uh, sometimes about my story or like my 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 experience or what advice can I give? And I'm like, am I even in the position of giving <laughs> advice on how to do this? Right. A lot of things have been random in my mind and mm. I think that's a very Danish maybe thing a way to perceive it like I have been lucky it has been random it has really not been me but uh, it has it has it has because because I had like pivotal moments in my life where I could have made a different decision and mm. obviously was gonna be a different outcome that most likely wouldn't have been the successful uh, situation in the one I'm finding myself in and mm. even I think I have done quite well I think you I, have done quite well, but yes. that there is still a, a lot more to do because I, I don't think I'm done. Amazing. Of course not. And there's so much that you're going to accomplish and I can't wait to see it and to be part of that. Thank you for being able to share. I know this is just like a, a piece of your story. I know there's more, but just by listening to your story, by gaining that awareness, by knowing that we have it, we can do those things. Um, I'm I'm so thankful that you are here, Andrina. <laughs> no, no, thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, if any other time you want to pick up in any of what we have discussed here, just reach out. Yes, I mean, I always say there's a few interviews when we say that we need a part two to hear what happened next <laughs> with, with a situation or some people share that they're waiting for a visa. So I'm always like, you can always come back and we would love to hear what are you going to do next. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that he had a happy ending, even though he had his difficulties and you just grew like and, and that's what's beautiful, right? You, you really made the best out of the situation. Absolutely. Gracias. <laughs>
De nada, de nada.